books. The photography department of Raman Research Institute would be used to make 35 mm slides for us. Okay, and even the secretarial support to to a large extent we used to get from Raman Research Institute all our scripts and other things, especially because our founder director Professor Vishweshwara was senior professor there. All our initial programs, I think first three programs, even the typing took place in Raman Research Institute. And I am very happy that the relation is deepening now. The relation with the uh, uh, Raman Research Institute doesn't stop there. You know, when uh, non-formal science education activities were started, scientists from Raman Research Institute used to come here and teach. Professor Bala Ayer, a very senior professor, is associated with uh, 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 our REAP program since the beginning, and even today he guides REAP program. And several uh, senior scientists from RRI, Professor G. S. Ranganath, Professor Eshodan Hatwane, Professor Biman Nath, all of them have come to Planetarium to teach and also to give popular lectures. Now that with this uh, 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 starting of this new series, Engineering uh, Frontier Science, our relations are becoming stronger and deeper. Another happy news I would like to share with you is, all these days we were sort of constrained by lack of facilities in the planetarium. Last year, government has sanctioned an auditorium complex which has got five lecture halls, an observatory, an activity room, and a 600-seater auditorium. And this facility is almost complete, and maybe it takes another two, three months, and it will be ready for use. With that, uh, facility becoming available and with the support of science community in Bangalore, we will be doing a lot more programs and uh, uh, maybe you can expect a lot of things happening in planetarium. We have with us today a very distinguished Dr. Jeremy Lazu who has worked on Perseverance rover which landed on Mars. I extend a hearty welcome to you sir. I extend a warm welcome to all the people in the audience. Now I request Professor Tarun Saurudhu to address the gathering. Thank you. So friends, uh, it's my great pleasure to be at this inaugural talk of a new series, uh, Engineering Frontier Science. And uh, so this is uh, something I feel reflects the kind of ethos of Raman Research Institute. And I feel very strongly that, uh, you know, uh, this should be something that should reach out to the masses. So just a few words about the Raman Research Institute. Uh, many of you in Bangalore would know more about it than I do yet. I'm learning. But uh, our institute is now celebrating its 75th year. In fact, uh, we will complete 75 years on November 7th. And as a part of that, we are also taking new initiatives to reach out more uh, widely to the public and more deeply into the students and, uh, you know, trying to promote how science is done, okay? So in this uh, period that I've been here, one of the things that struck me from the beginning is the very unique character of Raman Research Institute. I've been in various other institutes at different roles and what really is very striking in the Raman Research Institute over the entire period is the fact that it is one institute where science and technology, engineers and scientists work together. Okay, there's hardly any you know distinction between the two, and most of the scientists know that their you know whatever quest will be fulfilled because you have the engineering support. And most of the engineers know that their capabilities and you know innovations is what the scientists are looking for. So there's a very strong you know bond between that. And uh, in my experience, this has been a character of frontier sciences anywhere in the world. Okay, and I think this is something that India needs to really adopt in a big way. And you know, RRI already has it. Other institutes have it, but you know, I think they are scope to improve this much more. And with that thought, we 
you know, wanted to bring to the public's attention this vast possibility of how engineers and technologists make great science possible. And that is what this series will focus on uh, in its uh, talks that we will have. Uh, we hope to have many such visitors. We, and uh, we will also have our own uh, scientists uh, uh, who will come and give talks. And I hope uh, that, you know, as the talks grow in number, we'll soon have uh, students of science as well as engineering coming, flocking to these talks. And uh, so before I conclude, let me also uh, take the pleasure of introducing uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy Lassou. So Dr. Jeremy Lassou is, a, is an astronomer, a designer of space instruments, and an avid observer of Mars, comets, and asteroids. He's also a you know, teacher of mathematics and physics at undergraduate and graduate levels. And he's currently an adjunct astronomer at the observator Midi Pyrenees. Is that right? OK, France. And uh, before he went there, he had uh, done his postdoctoral work at uh, the French Space Agency and at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the US. And uh, he has been involved in frontier you know, science space exploration projects. So namely, you know, the ChemCam and uh, Mars 2020, Envision Mission to Mars, Rosetta Consort, etc. And uh, he has also been recognized for his uh, expertise and contribution. He has had several awards, including the Certificate of Outstanding Contribution to the ESA Rosetta mission in 2017, uh, Outstanding Contribution in Reviewing the ICARES uh, mission, and more recently, IAU uh, honored Jeremy by naming an asteroid after him. It's uh, 1998. KE1 Lasu. Uh, so this is the professional introduction, but I must add that I, it's personally a moment of great delight because when I first met Jeremy, he was in his final year as a Ecole Polytechnique student, and he spent a year doing his master's project with me at Ayuka. So. Not only did he earn his master's degree with that project, but he earned something more. His lifetime partner is also from Ayuka. She was another of her graduate students, a very talented cosmologist. And uh, so in some sense, I'm happy to see him back as accomplished uh, scientist. It always is a pleasure for any researcher to see this. And also, I'm very glad that uh, you know, due to the clever thinking of mine, uh, he'll be coming to India quite often as I see it. Thank you very much. So we look forward to uh, you know, his uh, presentation. Uh, being at Ayuka and being working with uh, Tamun was a great pleasure and I had a lot of fun with uh, you know, the, the kind of work we did for CMB at the time. But obviously I changed a bit my uh, topic since then and um, Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the current Mars exploration with the Perseverance rover and the Supercanis Mount, which was built in our institute in France and uh, partially with the Los Alamos Institute in the US. So I'm going to use this pointer to point a few things to the slide. And uh... all right. So let's start by giving you a little bit of overview about where we are with the Mars exploration today. So what you can see on this slide are the current assets that we have that's still working around Mars. We've got eight orbiters that are still working, and this, the, the ones that are already on Mars are the ones to the left of that vertical line here. And so we've got eight orbiters working and four landers and rovers that are on the surface of Mars. Uh, historically, of course, NASA, the US, Europe, and Russia have explored that planet. What you can notice though is that we've got some new players in the field starting to get pretty busy nowadays. Uh, we've got the United Arab Emirates with their uh, orbiter here. 
the MON mission, uh, Mongol Alien, from uh, India is still working on Mars after 10 years. And uh, China uh, was extremely successful for a challenging thing. They actually successfully put an orbiter, a lander, and a rover that were on the surface of Mars for several months. Um, then after that, uh, we've got a set of missions that, are, that I'm going to describe to you at the end of that uh, presentation because this is the future and what scientists would really like to have in their hands would be pieces of rocks coming from Mars. Is it still working? Uh, and for that, we intend to have some Mars sample returns from the NASA program and from the Chinese program as well. So the dates here are likely to be around the 2030s maybe a bit later, um, but uh, I'm going to show you a bit what uh, we envision for that side. So now I'm going to talk to you about the Perseverance rover, which is here, We've been on Mars for a bit more than two years, and this is actually the first step in order to bring back samples that are of relevance for the scientists on Earth, because what we are doing is to core with the drill that we have samples from rocks that have been selected prior to that, and uh, we kept them into the rover, and uh, because they are a well-selected set of samples, I'm going to describe to you, they are of high interest for the studies that we want to do on Earth. Unlike the Martian meteorites, which can come from random places on Mars, here we know where they're coming from, we know they've been already analyzed in situ, and uh, they are actually sampling a very interesting part of the planet. All right, just uh, in order to tell you a bit the context of why we are interested in sending so many actually uh, space missions to that planet and why it's so important for us. This is um, a diagram, if you want, of the solar system, as we know it, with the eight planets and the sun. Nothing here is to scale, eh? don't worry about that. Um, but Mars is the fourth planet from the sun uh, in, this, um, uh, in this plot. Venus is a planet that could be interesting. It's actually almost the same size as the Earth. But being a bit closer to the sun, the surface of Venus is actually completely uninhabitable. The temperature is about 450 degrees, the lead will melt, uh, it actually rains sulfuric acid, the pressure is 100 times, like 90, 92 times the pressure of the Earth. So uh, not really an habitable planet. Interesting for other purposes, but if you want to try to find a place where life could have emerged on the, in the solar system, Mars would be your best bet, and it's relatively close to the Earth. It's half the size of the Earth, so the gravity is a bit less, but as you can see here on that uh, image taken from the, the Space Telescope, when you look at it, well, there is a little atmosphere, it's thin, it's 100 of the atmosphere of the Earth in terms of pressure, so 7 millibars. Uh, it's mostly an atmosphere of CO2, but you can see clouds, clouds of water ice. You can also see seasons and you can see polar caps, which are also made of water ice, just like you see on Earth. Actually, it's very close to Earth also in terms of time of day. It's 24 hours and 37 minutes. Um, the year is a bit longer. And the temperatures, they reach very low temperatures at night, so minus 100 degrees, but it can be above zero degrees um, at the equator around noon. So it can lead to melting of the water. And liquid water is what we are looking for if we want to have habitable environments in the solar system. So that's why it's so interesting. And if we look at the surface of the planet, this is actually a topographical map taken by a laser altimeter on a bit on Mars. Uh, we can see that there, is, there are two regions mainly on the planet, and the southernmost region of the planet uh, has a lot of craters, it looks a bit like the moon. Uh, we've got also, uh, for geologists, this is actually like a paradise because we've got so many different things to look at. So here it's the quartering processes in the solar system, here you've got the most the biggest volcano that you get in the solar system with Olympus Mons being the one here, 30 kilometers in, uh, in height, and the surface is the area of France. Uh, you've got the biggest canyon in the solar system here with Ballas Marionese, and the topmost part, the northern hemisphere of the planet, is actually very, very smooth, which indicates that it's actually a really uh, young part of the planet. It didn't have enough time to accrete all the craters that you may have. And when we look closely at this, that's the border, we see that there's been things happening. You know, you can see erosion of those craters, you can see floods happening, and let's look a bit closer. This is the transition between ancient and young Mars. And what we see in ancient Mars 
are the indirect uh, I mean, the, the definitive proofs that liquid water was present early in the history of the planet. We've got these drainage areas and lots of rivers, just like you would find on Earth. You've got those floods and erosion of the crater that you would find here, and some islands, actually. These features can only be shaped with liquid water. There's not really any other processes that could work for that. Other features of water, you know, uh, eroding the surface of the planet. And in some cases, we find deltas deposits. And that means that water was circulating here, carrying with it sediments that were depositing in a body, standing body of water, like a lake or an ocean, and then up you've got this kind of structure that have been seen from the orbit. So not only the geomorphology, but also this is actually um, a time scale of the uh, of the evolution of the of the Mars planet. And here, what you see are the different times for the mineralogical signature we see from orbit with spectrometers, typically in the infrared. For ancient Mars, which is to the left we detect a lot of clays, and clays are formed by the interaction of liquid water with rocks. Then we see sulfates. Sulfates, you need a more acidic environment, but you still need water in order to deposit this kind of salts. So water would bring uh, these sulfates, and then water evaporates, for example, in a pond, and it will leave sulfates at the bottom, just like it leaves salt, uh, if it is a salty water. And then after that, well, for three billion years, you've got uh, fake oxides, which is essentially rust, and rust is what gives the planet its color. As you can see, you know, it's red. So what we think happened is that um, ancient man, uh, so current Mars is here, and if you put a drop of water, liquid water on the surface of Mars today, it will not last very long. Why? For two reasons. Because in this diagram you've got pressure, and we know that the pressure of Mars is very low, and at the same time we've got a low temperature. So we are here in this uh, diagram for the different states of water. So, um, here you would have liquid water, here you would have vapor, and here you would have solid water. So solid water can be formed on Mars, but if you've got liquid water, it will change either to ice or sublimate very quickly into the vapor. So going through below the triple point here. What we think happened in the past is that you had a lot more atmosphere and temperatures that were higher so that water could be flowing and staying liquid at the surface of Mars for a longer period of time that we have today. So what that means is that possibly Mars in the past was covered with a significant layer of water. Today, it's more of a desert. But that's interesting for us because let's compare the timeline for Mars as a planet, which is here on top, and the timeline for Earth as a planet, which is at the bottom. And so all the planets in the solar system were formed 4.5 billion years ago, same thing as the sun, everything else. And initially it's very hot huh? because you treat matter, it will have a lot of energy, you've got the impacts, it tends to create a lot of heat. But then water would tend to be at the surface and will make the surface cooler. And that's what happens at about 4 billion years ago. And we expect Mars to have a significant amount of water, we also have a lot of water on Earth. What happened for Mars is that after some point, so formation of clays, formation of sulfates, and then you get to the phase of fake oxides, and the surface became cold and dry like three billion years ago. What happened on Earth is that <coughs> at uh, about this time, you start to have the emergence of life with essentially monocellular life, so bacteria, uh, you know, these kind of things, until 500 uh, to 600 million years ago, you've got multicellular organisms rising on Earth. And we know them very well, they look like that. Okay, and then us. So are we looking for extraterrestrial life like that on Mars? Well, absolutely not. We think that it didn't have enough time for life to evolve from the cellular life to the multicellular organisms. So what we're looking at is more, I mean, less than this, and more something like this. These are the most ancient traces of life that you have found on Earth in rocks that date back to 3.7 billion years ago. And those are actually little globules of uh, carbon. And those are also only matter in a, in a cell that's been metamorphosed and it's uh, mostly made of hematite. And they are, you know, uh, of the micron scale. So the, the microbes, the you know, microbial life is what we are looking at if you want to try to find the emergence of life on Earth as well as on Mars. That's what we are looking for. But Mars has an advantage, has an advantage with respect to Earth. 
Because on Earth, you know that we've got a lot of climate, there's a lot of rain, especially during the monsoon. You've got also plate tectonics, and that recycles the rocks on the surface of the Earth. And this tends to be very, very uh, bad for the old rocks that we have and that we are looking for. If you look at this, this is a map of the Earth, and where the oldest rocks are found there. Well, the gray parts are the rocks that are older than 2.5 billion years ago. That's why we are interested in the rocks that are older than 3.7 billion years ago. The yellow dots here. And we've got just a few places on Earth where you can find them. You know, some are in Canada, in Australia, South Africa, a bit in China. But they're extremely rare because they've been eroded by the climate, they've been destroyed by the plate tectonics. If you look at Mars, well, Mars is smaller, but the surface of Mars is still the total surface of the continents we've got on Earth. So it's a lot of diversity. And more than 50% of that surface is older than 3.6 billion years ago. We know that from the crater Comte. And so that means that Mars has kept, if life emerged like the same way on Earth and on Mars, Mars has kept the best traces of it that we could find in the solar system, probably. So that's why going to Mars is, you know, mostly trying to find our origins. Okay, just a little word about what we need to do if we want to detect traces of extraterrestrial life, just like I was mentioning. So we are not looking for fossils. Fossils are way too big and we don't think they have time to evolve on Mars. We are looking for microbial life. There are several hints that would tell us if it's actually I mean, if it's due to microbial life on the surface of Mars. So some of them are due to ratios of isotopes, the same kind of atoms but with different weights in different types of neutrons in their, in their nucleus. Um, because life prefers some isotopes with respect to other atoms. There are also organic molecules. If we find new brands, you know, that's going to be a, you know, a smoking gun for potential activity of life. If we find specific minerals, specific assemblages, like uh, forming cells and forming you know, the, the kind of uh, things that we see in uh, terrestrial life. And then the structures in the rocks, which could be formed by mass of microbial you know, activity, just like you would have in those structures here, uh, stromatolites uh, that you can find in Australia, for example. So all these to put together, if you've got all those different hints, then we would have a strong argument to say that life on Earth on Mars, and that we've got, you know, you know, we can say that this is due to life. But we need kind of all of them if we want to make an argument about that. We need a strong proof in order to make a strong statement, obviously. And so. A summary for that part of the talk, these are the current objectives of Mars science. At this point, mostly what we want to do if we, if we could find whether life has emerged on the surface of Mars, this is actually the, the direction we are going to. But Mars is also interesting for other topics. For geophysicists, it's very interesting to see how planets evolve. You know, it's a test bed, if you want, of how planets evolve without the plate technique we've got on Earth. And for climatologists, it's also very interesting. It has less of a, I mean, the Climate on Mars is actually less complex than what you have on Earth. So it can be a good test bed to test the models that we do on Earth in order to predict the climate. So for climatology, it's extremely good for testing our models. So now I'm going to present to you what we've done with Perseverance and SuperCam, the instrument we've built, uh, in order to search for traces of life on Mars and in Jezero Crater and in order to prepare the Mars sample return. Obviously, all the um, traces of life that we are looking at is difficult to find, especially in instruments that are in space, because we are limited by the mass of the instruments. They are, don't have the same resolution that we can do in laboratory on Earth, where the instrument can be as big as this room, if you want. And so, bringing back those samples is going to really help try to determine whether life emerged or not. So these are the official scientific objectives of perseverance from NASA. We are looking at trying to understand the context in geology. We are looking at trying to understand the onset, the emergence of life on Mars, so astrobiology. We are preparing the return of the samples by using sample caching, doing cores of those rocks that we find interesting, putting them there, and uh, expecting them to be returned uh, within 10 years. There's also some demonstrators for technologies on board. One is the Ingenuity, the little helicopter. I'm going to show you a little movie about that. And uh, the other one is to prepare for uh, humans going to Mars. Uh, so that's the MOXIE experiment, which intended to create uh, oxygen molecules from the CO2 atmosphere of Mars. And that worked. All right. 
we were discussing before during the presentation the uh, discussions that happen between scientists and engineers. And looking for a place to learn maths needs these discussions because the scientists will go to all the places that are very interesting, but where the engineers tell you can't land. So you need to find a good, an optimal place where you can land. On a, for example, you know, a typical thing that we have for requirements as a scientist from the engineers is that well, we can't really land very far away from the equator. Why? Because we need a lot more fuel in order to go to the poles than in order to stay at the equator where you know, you've got the ecliptic plane of the solar system and where you're actually reaching the planet. So we need a place that is interesting, but within like 40 degrees from the equator, typically. And so we look at the equator, and fortunately for us, this is also the place where I was telling you, you know, a lot of water um, actually flowed from the highlands that are here in the south um, hemisphere of Mars to the northern hemisphere of Mars. And a lot of places here have kept the traces of this flowing water. And one of them is Jezero Crater, which is located here. Let's have a closer look. This is a 45 kilometer diameter crater on the surface of Mars. And the observatories on orbit around Mars have shown that well, there is this smoking gun for liquid water activity and sediment deposit because we've got a delta that has been formed here. So likely this crater actually contained a standing body of water where the sediments were pushed by the flowing water from the river and deposited there. You have the same thing in India. This is the delta of the Ganges and Brahmaputra. Same kind of principle applies there in order to form the delta here that you've got where you've got the Sundarbans. Okay. So flowing river deposits some sediments in a standing body of water like an ocean or a lake and kept them there. On top of that, you remember when I was talking about flowing water on the surface of Mars, I was also telling you that some minerals can tell us whether Mars um, activity was strong or not. So here we've got those minerals detected from orbit on the de delta part of the crater. And so the colors tell you, for example, in blue here, you've got the clays. So that means water stayed long enough in order to alter the rocks in order to form those minerals. Uh, carbonates, they also form in water. And we can find them here they are in yellow and green, uh, closer to the rim of the crater. And olivine is an interesting mineral, it's more in use, and it's found here at the bottom part of the, um, of the crater. So, but detecting clay, detecting carbonates, we know that water flowed, we know that water flowed for a significant amount of time. And forming the delta is also very interesting because deltas on Earth have a tendency to, because they deposit sediment constantly, if life emerges in the lake, then the dead animals would tend to fall at the bottom, they will be recovered by sediments, and then they will be protected from further erosion on the planet. So those deltas have a tendency to protect the traces of light that we are looking for. And for all those reasons, Jezero Equator was decided as a landing site uh, on Mars. Uh, note that the size of the ellipse needs to fit in there because we don't want to land in a place which has a lot of topography, yeah, otherwise uh, our engineers would not be pleased. So that's good. And uh, yeah, we avoided the delta, we needed to go up into the delta after uh, landing the rover. Okay, now it's time for engineers who are amazing people uh, to build this, uh, um, this include uh, robot and instruments, and also the crew stage, the descent stage, the heat shield, the back shell, and everything needs to fit there. Uh, this is the highway one in uh, JPL, uh, Caltech, uh, California. So this is a 10,000 class uh, clean room because you don't want to detect the light that you brought with you from Earth, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so this is extremely, extremely, extremely clean. Um, uh, and so yeah, if you want to enter this and you need to put all the, the, the suit and uh, everything in order to put there, but uh, the rover is there, all the stages are here. And it's all assembled there. Again, it's uh, sent to Florida where Captain Everall is located and where the launcher will actually take place. And you need to stack all those different parts. So you've got the rover here, that's the sky crane just above it. And these are the, you know, the, the shield is below and the stage is that will help uh, actually land safely the rover on the surface of Mars. How does this happen? So first we had the launch in July 30, 2020 during COVID uh, in Florida. 
Well, that was actually very challenging also to do that mission during the COVID times. I remember uh, we, we have a tendency because we work in France, uh, us and our team of engineers for the instrument. So we have a lot of uh, use for the Zoom because we don't travel to the US so often. But during COVID time, it was actually all the time and it tended to be a bit difficult, even at GPR. But success for the launch, then the transit between uh, Earth and Mars, which is typically about six months. And then we arrive on Mars, and Mars has a little bit of complications to provide to you if you want to land softly on it. Because uh, you arrive at uh, five kilometers per second, and you need to arrive on the surface of the planet at zero kilometers per second. So you need to decelerate very strongly. And the um, atmosphere of Mars is thin, it's 100 for the atmosphere of the Earth. But it's too thick. If you arrive too fast, you will burn. So that's why you need a heat shield at a quite tender. Uh, then you remove the heat shield, and then you need a parachute. The parachute will help, you know, get to a lower speed, but it's not enough because the atmosphere is not thick enough. So then you need to remove the parachute, and you need to end with retro rockets on the sky plane here, the sky plane, and then make the rover descend down to the surface, and then it will uh, uh, cut the cables here and go somewhere else to crash. On top of that, during the descent of so one thing I didn't mention yet, but Mars is relatively far from the Earth. If you want to send a message from the Earth to Mars, it will take on average 20 minutes. So if you want the response from your, the people who are communicating with you from Mars, it will take 40 minutes to get the answer. And all this descent and landing will happen in seven minutes. You have no time to interact with that mission doing this. So all this is automatic. It needs to work perfectly if you want to land on Mars. And you see in all the different stages of that landing, it's, it's pretty challenging and, uh, you know, uh, kudos to all the engineers who've been able to do that. Because they successfully did this two times, once for Curiosity in 2012 and now in 2021 for the landing of Perseverance. I don't have time to show you uh, the movie, but we've got any, uh, a lot of cameras on board the rover and also on board the sky plane that took all the images of the landing and descent. And so if you want, you can go online and look at uh, the movie, it's like uh, seven minutes. Uh, but you, you see the, the parachute, you see the, the jetties on all the different steps and how they worked. This is, uh, I, I really like this image because we still have, you know, these orbiters on Mars and they've got telescopes. And one of these telescopes is called High Rise, it takes the highest resolution images on Mars. And uh, it actually took an image of the parachute and the rover being lowered. Here at the back here, you can see the delta, and this is just the equator, obviously. So it all happened fine, and we finally landed in on the surface of Mars. And so immediately, the scientists precipitated themselves in order to do science. No, forget it. Our engineer's colleague, they tell us that, uh, no, wait, wait, wait. First, we need to do the commissioning phase. So the commissioning phase is essentially taking some time in order to make sure that all the systems of the spacecraft are operational, that they function correctly. And that takes uh, from a few weeks to a few months. So the first thing that we do is we take images with the hazard cameras. There are the cameras at the bottom of the river that can tell us whether the wheels are in good shape and uh, if they, we've got big blocks that are blocking our path. And then this is the, uh, the panorama from the navigation cameras, the nav cams. They are on top of the mast, and they look all around the river, and they are used by the engineers in order to define where the rover is supposed to go, with the help of the scientists, obviously. Uh, and then we check all the hardware systems that we have. So we start by doing a few drives and see if all the engines for the wheels are working fine. We took out the arm. It takes us a few days in order to take out the arm and uh, take a, a core on a, on a rock. And uh, this below here, it's a, a mosaic panorama around the rover from the scientist, so the scientific camera that are on top of the mast. And this is pretty, pretty good. When we saw that, we knew we were in the right place because we've got a field of rocks. Uh, we landed actually two kilometers away from the delta, and the delta that we see from orbit has a different shape, obviously, from the ground. But this is the delta. This is the, those little hills kind of in the front. That's the delta, and there's a remnant of delta here to the left. We'll talk about that a bit more later. And the hills at the back are the rim, the sides of the crater. And the goal of the mission is to go through the delta and through that passage here, the valley, out of the crater in order to also select uh, rocks outside the crater. All right. So after several weeks, 
Now the scientists and the engineers agree that everything is functioning properly and we still need the engineers to drive the rover for us, but we tell the engineers where to go and we can start doing proper science. And the first thing that we wanted to do, so we landed here. Um, yes, the landing site is located here. And you see that we've got different types of terrains uh, to explore before we reach actually the delta here. Um, and especially this terrain, which is a bit uh, you know, fracture and robust that you can see here in the middle, uh, where is where we put the signature of living from orbit. So we really wanted to have a sample from that area. The problem is, and I will show you some more images later, but you've got a lot of dunes located in that place. So you cannot go from the landing site directly here because you've got the risk of uh, blocking the rover by the sand, you know. And if you do anything bad to the rover, like, you know, uh, breaking one of the engines of the arm or something like that, you can't repair it. You can't send astronauts to repair that. So you need to be extra careful about it. So we did the tour in order to go around here and to do the sampling in this area, which is free of sand, which is called, uh, so you've got SETA. This is the whole area of olive rich uh, signals. And we went all around here and we did the sampling here on the bottom. And then we went back all over, over there and we started to do something of the delta in this area, which we, which we call free forks, and where we have actually deposited a contingency uh, set of samples. Okay, so now that we are acquainted with the environment where our rover is evolving, uh, time to tell you a few things about the um, instruments. As you have noticed in the title of my talk, I'm going to talk mostly about SuperCam, which is the instrument we built, but uh, I can tell you a few words about the other ones. Um, so on board the rover, we've got the MassCam zoom cameras. They are the scientific cameras. Uh, they are located here below uh, the big eye. The eye is actually the telescope of SuperCam. And you've got also the navigation cameras on the sides as well. MEGA is a weather station. It measures the wind speed, the agrometry, the atmosphere. Um, uh, it's located on the mast. At the back of the rover, we've got a radar, ground penetrating radar. In fact, it gives us some information about the structure of the uh, subsurface under the rover down to 10, 20 meters. Uh, MOXIE is this experiment that was supposed to produce oxygen from the atmosphere of Mars. I'm going to show you uh, one slide about it. And then at the end of the arm, what we have is the drill bit where we, that we use to actually sample the rocks. But we also have instruments there to look very closely at the rocks. So we've got the camera, which is like, essentially like a microscope. Huh? Sherlock is a Raman spectrometer to get an information about the mineralogy of those rocks. And Pixel is an X-ray spectrometer, which tells us actually the uh, atomic composition of the rocks. And with that, we've got a lot of in-situ information about what we are sampling. But of course, my favorite instrument is SuperCam. So this is a collaboration between France and the US. The two major laboratories are ARAP in Toulouse and Los Alamos National Laboratory, Los Alamos. Um, so essentially, IWAP is responsible for the part that you see here, which is on top of the mast of the rover. We build the optics with a 10 centimeter telescope. We've got uh, electronics and a very powerful laser. Okay, I'll explain to you why it's powerful. Uh, we've got um, an infrared camera and an imaging camera back uh, at the back of the telescope. And then the light that is collected by the telescope is also sent to spectrometers on board the rover, which are built by our US colleagues. What do we do with this instrument? Actually, this is very interesting because we call it the Swiss knife of uh, geochemistry. We can do fast analysis of geochemistry at a distance from the rover. Why do we have a powerful laser on board? It's 14 millijoules, but it's pulsed at five nanoseconds. So actually, it, the, it, on the target, it will deploy five, I mean, 10 gigawatts of uh, power. And that's enough to uh, raise the temperature to 10,000 degrees. So that's more than the surface temperature of the sun. And essentially, all the elements that constitute your target will sublimate, um, sublimate into a plasma, like a spark. And the light from the spark uh, comes back. We can analyze it. And this tells us what are the atoms inside the target. We've got infrared uh, spectroscopy, which gives us some structures for the minerals. We've got Raman spectroscopy. By changing the frequency of the laser, we can actually uh, change its wavelength to fire into the green, 532 nanometers. And using that, 
we can actually have uh, Raman spectra from the targets as well. It gives us some information about molecules and minerals. We've got a microphone on board, which is giving us some information about the sounds. That's the, there were several microphones that were sent to Mars before, but they never actually worked. And this is the first working microphone on the surface of Mars. And then, with the imaging, we can get picture and morphology of the rocks. So this is an example of a study of a rock that we did early in the mission, uh, 16 soils. Oh, you'll notice that the soils are actually the days on Mars, and we've got our clocks working on the Martian days. So actually, initially in the mission, we were working on Martian soils instead of terrestrial days. And so that means every day you change your clock with respect to the Earth by 37 minutes. After two weeks, you work at night. After another two weeks, you work during the day. And it's pretty difficult to follow. I mean, it gets you tired very quickly. Uh, nowadays, we actually work. Um, we, we can tell the robot to do things in advance. And that allows us to have more regular uh, activities for us on Earth. But yeah, so these are the soil numbers we count in soil. And after so 16 days, essentially, we were analyzing this rock. So the rock is seen here in the navigation cameras. So not a lot of details. Then higher resolution with the mass cam camera, which are the scientific cameras. And then a much higher resolution with a telescope. So here you can actually see the different grain structure uh, on the rock. You can see the cover of dust that you have, a changing of you know, tone or color from the bottom part of the rock to the upper part of the rock. So there's a lot of information you can get from these images. But of course, we don't have and if you wanted to have this resolution for a full panorama, uh, you need to take a lot of images, so we can't do that. So we are complementary between the different cameras. And for example, we looked very closely at this remnant of the uh, delta. So this was formed and was part of the delta. The, it was initially linked with the delta, but this part has been eroded to the right. And when we look very closely at it, you can see that there are structures in the rocks. And those were able, we, we were able to actually interpret them. So if you look here, what you see is that the upper layers, strata of the rocks, are mostly horizontal. Then you've got sloping parts of the rock here, with a strong slope actually. And then at the bottom, you don't see them very clearly here, maybe if I go back, yeah, so, no, not really, but there are parts of that are close, um, better than that, but we, we notice that they are also horizontal. And this is typically uh, relevant with respect to advancing deltas. So the deltas, you've got the river coming here from the right, and it will transport sediments. The bigger sediments will deposit horizontally on the top of the, the delta before they arrive to the lake surface. And then we've got the sloping will change in the size of the grains, and the smallest grains will be deposited horizontal layers at the bottom. And so that's what we see. Also, you see the bigger blocks are on top. So this is a proof that we had an advancing delta into a liquid body of water that was stagnating there, like a lake. It was about the surface of the Geneva Lake in Europe. And, um, and so that's one of the first publications that we had in science with the rover. So next, I was telling you that we can do analysis of the rocks using the laser. So laser shoots a laser shot on the target, which can be up to 10 meters away from the rover. The surface gets um, as a spectrum here from the lips analysis on Mars. So that was the target called Mars. And all the different lines can be analyzed. So our uh, telescope collects the light, sends it to a spectrometer inside the rover, and then we've got this kind of spectra that we can analyze. So here we've put the names of all the different lines that we can see. And we can see all the major lines forming the rocks. You've got silicon, you've got iron, you've got aluminum, you've got titanium, you've got uh, calcium and magnesium, all these things. They are the strongest lines in spectra. Some of the minor lines can be very interesting too. Here, you've got the hydrogen and carbon lines. And hydrogen is very interesting because it will trace water. The carbon line can be interesting because it will trace carbonates or organics. Uh, and here we've got manganese. So we can detect manganese and we can detect many other minor elements. And manganese is interesting because on Earth it can trace uh, some of the um, mats, microbiological mats uh, that are formed and doing some coatings on top of the of rocks. Obviously, it's very nice of the Hama Research Institute to have invited me to give this talk. And I need to mention, you know, the uh, platinum jubilee of the RI by saying that uh, Raman spectroscopy is now used on another planet. And I think Sir Raman uh, would be extremely proud to see 
the first on a spectra taken on Mars. So this is the single line from a diamond that we have amongst our calibration targets. That was the first uh, Raman spectrum taken on Mars. And now we've got many more that tell us uh, all the minerals and the molecules that we can find inside those rocks. I'm going to show you a few more of those results. This is already great. Scientific sounds. So we've got a microphone on board. With the microphone, we can hear all the sounds that are surrounding the rover, including the helicopter or the, the, the rover sounds and the wind. Uh, but we use it. Ah. So you can hear it. So these are the sounds taken on Mars. And this corresponds to the spectrum here. This is our laser shooting the rocks. Every time you create a spark, well, you've got also a, a, a shock wave that is emitted from the spark to your ear, and you can hear the sound. That's what our microphone does. And just like you would have a different sound if you were doing a, a shot, I mean, if you were you know, looking on this wood and looking on this plastic, same thing happens here. We've got different sounds if we shoot at different rocks, and that tells us the hardness of the rock. All right, I would like to describe to you a bit the process that we use in order to sample rocks. I'm going to use one signal example, but we've done more than 20 so far. Uh, so this is Rochette Rock. This is one of the first rocks we have sampled. And you arrive, you, you need to find, again, discussion between scientists, and we do that every day. Yeah? So we are used to it. We like our engineers, and the engineers like us, hopefully. <laughs> but so discussion between the scientists and the engineers. We need to find a rock that is suitable for drilling. So it needs to be hard enough, but not too hard, because our drill has limited you know, ranges of hardness. Uh, this one looked uh, nice. It's also flat, because if it's not flat, we can't drill properly with the hammer. No? If it's on the, the side like that, crooked, it's not going to work. So it needs to be horizontal. And uh, yeah, we need to assess the hardness of the rock in advance. Of course, we are very careful with what we have on board the rover in terms of uh, drilling capabilities, because we don't want to have any accident. We can't repair it. So the first thing we do before drilling is we do a little abrasion patch. This is a few millimeters uh, depth inside the rock in order, with the drill in order to see if we can drill it and if it has the right properties. The good thing is that it allows us to see inside the rock. So the external part of that abrasion patch will leave you a dust-free surface. And you can see on that side, for example, you've got some coating on the surface of the rock. And inside the rock, we, we see the different uh, kind of minerals that are formed there, the grains. And then we can use also this in order to detect in situ the kind of minerals and uh, the kind of grains we've got there. So SuperCam is used, and we've done some analysis here. So you can see, uh, so this is the RMI, the remote micro imager that we have with the telescope, image of that rock. And we see the grains. We can have uh, an idea of the inus composition of the rock by looking at the major elements. And we have detected those salt grains, uh, perchlorates and sulfates, that we detected with the Raman spectroscopy on board SuperCam. Then we can also use the instruments at the end of the arm. So Sherlock is another Raman spectrometer, which gives us some information about the mineralogy, detected some calcium-rich pyroxenes, detected some uh, sulfates as well. So you've got the color tell you actually the kind of minerals we've detected here. And the square here is six millimeters in size. So we are really looking at the microscopic size of the raw properties. Uh, when you look at this image, this speaks a lot to geologists. But when you look at this image, what you see is that the grains of the rock are relatively large. They are some, some millimeter scale, but not some micron scaled. And also that they are very angular. So they've not been eroded by water. So we can know from that and from the presence of salt that water was there. It deposited the salts, but it did not stay long enough in order to alter the grains of the rock. Because otherwise, you would have grains that are more round, and you would have also an alteration wind around the grains. We don't really see that. So water was there not very long. It's difficult to quantify the length of time that water was. Um, Pixel gives us some uh, composition information and there's a, a map grid. Again, this is a 6 mm by 6 mm square and we've discovered some sulfur, aluminium, and calcium content there. And those are the calcium sulfate grains I was talking about before. So, all those different instruments, they give you a different point of view on the rock and combined together gives us uh, an idea of the mineralogy. So, we know that this rock was actually formed, it's a minimalist rock didn't get altered too much by water, and so the bottom part of the floor of the crater is actually made mostly of igneous rocks, 
some enriched in olivine, the Zeta range that we have sampled as well, and some more rich in pyroxenes, like those ones. All right, so now we've done the analysis of the work on the abrasion patch, we need to do the core drilling. And so we use uh, the drill in order to do a, a hole that's uh, like six, seven centimeters down into the rock. And then we collect the sample and put it in a tube, sealed, and keep it with the rubber until we put it down on the ground on the surface of Mars for later to be picked up and sent back to Earth. The first sample that we tried, uh, unfortunately, the, the core didn't stay inside the, the tube. And so we sealed the tube that contains the atmosphere of Mars. Okay, but now what we do is we check that the core actually contains the piece of water that we're looking for. And there are some other, I mean, Mars always throws surprises to you, okay? So some of the rocks that we had, we thought they were hard enough, but then you drill them and only powder comes out, so you don't have your piece of rock, right? So you need to do it again. Well, it happens all the time. So. All right, uh, you can see with these images that yes, Seta is actually quite covered with lots of sand dunes. You don't want to be crossing this area with the way you're gonna lose your order forever. It's, it's not gonna go forward. So we needed to go across here and do the sample of olivines in Duavangar. These are the two samples that we've done in Seta. And uh, in color here, you've got the signal from orbit and the red shows you olivine. So olivine is another unused mineral but it's different from the rock I've shown you before. Actually, these are extremely big grains, and we think they were done by, uh, as a cumulate. So when lava actually starts to condense, to, uh, to become cold, at the bottom we would find the biggest grains, and this is probably was formed uh, as a bottom from a, a lava uh, containing uh, place. And we're still working on how this thing uh, came to be about. And you can see the diversity of, and this is a map that we made before we landed from the orbital um, uh, information. And we actually sampled the three types of terrains that we have looked at here. So the yellow brown, the dark brown, and the olivine rich uh, CETA formation. I told you we had the radar on board. And so this is a radar image of what's happening underground. The rover went through this uh, path here in order to do the sampling in CETA. And what you can see is that uh, there are associations between the signals we see from the radar and the erosion resistance rocks that we see on the surface here. Here, here it goes there, here it goes there. And all those uh, strata, they are stratified with a slope with respect to where we are. And they go down under. So these are within rich parts of the rocks. They actually tend to continue under the, the, the paroxysm rich rocks that we have on the left. And so we think that the pyroxene rocks came later and went above the olivine rocks, maybe by you know a lava flow or something. One word about the MOXIE experiment. So you've got CO2 in the atmosphere of Mars, but if you want to breathe, you know everybody knows that we need oxygen, which is O2. So the simple way to obtain O2 from CO2 is to remove the sea. And we've ways to do that by using electricity um, and pyrolysis of the atmosphere in order to uh, decompose the molecules. It re recomposes into oxygen, and then we can use that to make astronauts breathe. So that was a proof of concept to show that we, uh, on Earth, we know how to do that, and we wanted to make sure that it would work on Mars world problems. So we've done several runs. Moxie, that's the name of the experiment, created about six grams of oxygen in several hours of run. Uh, with 99% purity, yeah, it's good. And uh, astronauts needs would be a lot more, like 700 grams per day per astronaut. So you need 100 times the size of MOXIE if you want to generate the oxygen for four astronauts to explore the surface of Mars. The good thing about this is that you can send those, uh, those factories for oxygen in advance. They will produce oxygen from the atmosphere of Mars using solar panels, for example. And when the astronauts come, they would have all the oxygen they need in advance, that's the idea. Another piece of technology that was tested for the first time uh, on board the rover is Ingenuity, a small um, helicopter that was located at the bottom of the rover and then it was dropped on the surface of, the, of Mars. And then the rover escaped very quickly from the place where the <laughs> helicopter
helicopter was going to test its flight because if you lose control of the helicopter and if it bumps into your hover, again, you don't want that to happen, it would be very bad. Uh, so we defined the flight zone all around the place where the helicopter was and then the helicopter tested its flight. So you can see it well, went up and went down. And you can see the rotation of the two rotors. So you've got two uh, wings and they are rotating opposite so that you can keep the stability of the helicopter, otherwise it would turn uh, on itself. And uh, similarly, uh, it's uh, because the atmosphere is so thin, you need it to actually turn very, very fast. So it's 2,600 times per minute. That's uh, 40 times per second, and it's much faster than an helicopter on Earth, obviously. But it worked. It has a little camera, and it was um, uh, warranted in order to work for like uh, five flights, and so far it's done 52 flights. And it's still following the rover at a fair distance. All right, I need to talk to you about the cache because now we are, so we've seen how we do the operations, we've seen the instruments, what they are able to do in situ, but it may not be enough in order to find traces of life as we are searching for them on the surface of Mars. So the real goal of that mission is to prepare selected samples that are of good quality for bringing them back to Earth. And for that, we've got 43 tubes, including five witnesses. So the five witness tubes, they are tubes that we will keep empty. And we'll analyze them on Earth, we'll return them again. But the idea of those tubes is that we know whether there was contamination either when we put the, the tubes in orbit on Mars or when we brought them back to Earth, that we allow us to say if there was any problem during the return of the mission. Okay. Um, so those are empty, so we are left with uh, 38 tubes that we are going to fill up with uh, different types of materials. So I showed you, we take out the drill, we take a core from the... Um, so every core is like a few centimeters long and one centimeter in thickness, it's a few tens of grams of rock each time. And total mass of the rocks that will be brought to Earth will be something like uh, half a kilogram. But that's still, it's a suite of samples that are really, really different and very interesting. So here is a family image of all the samples we've done so far. Those are the images taken on the Arrival patches each time, because every time we test before we do the real call. Uh, we've also taken a sample of regolith. Uh, the regolith is just the soil on the surface, huh? so we've got a specific tube for that, we just yeah, without draining. And so we've uh, taken 10 of those. Uh, every time, for the first part of the mission, we were taking two samples for every walk. Why? Because we don't know when the rover is going to fail, if it fails. And if the rover fails, all the samples are in it, how are you going to get them back? And you go there and you open a can or something. You need a can opener for it, it's bad. So we took 10 samples of those, the ones that we made in bubble, and we deposited them just at the bottom of the delta here. They include rocks from the bottom floor of the crater and rocks from the first parts of the delta here. We, we climbed the little delta sample and then got them back. And those suites of samples include igneous rocks. This would be interesting in order to date the rocks that we have here. And we've got also the sedimentary rocks that were deposited on the delta. And the science community has decided that if the rover fails, well, we hope it will be able to fulfill its full mission, but if the rover fails, already this set of 12 tubes are interesting enough to be brought back to Earth by the Mars Imperator mission. But we are going to go further. So this is where we are now. We've done 20 kilometers on the surface of Mars. Uh, the rover has climbed up the delta. We are currently exploring near this uh, big crater we call Belva, and we are located here. The Ingenuity helicopter is nearby, but more than 100 meters away. Uh, we don't, but it's still working. and still taking images in advance of the rover. That's nice. Um, and this week, uh, if you keep track of it, all the images that are taken by the rover are online for you to download if you want to look at them every day. So if you want to look at them, this week we are doing a new sample on a new builder, on a new rock. So I know that because I was on operation last week. <laughs> uh, just a very quick video to show you what the rover does. So like I told you before, if you want to operate the rover, and if you want to do it in real time, you would need to wait 40 minutes every time the rover does something in order to know what happened. So what we do typically is that we um, planify a full day or several days of work for the rover in advance. And that includes the drives. So this shows you actually what the rover does for the drives. We simulate that on computers with our engineers. And um, 
we know that the rover is going to drive through a path that doesn't have big obstacles huh? that we get from the panorama cameras, uh, the navigation cameras. But the rover is also a bit intelligent now. It can take images around itself and decide whether it's, there is an obstacle or not. And it can, you know, in order to keep it safe, it can keep itself safe for the whole day. If it feels that it's not going forward and that there's a problem, it will put itself into safe mode and ask for help from, uh, from the Earth, from us. But here we've done some navigations with uh, the navigation system of the rover, and that's an example. It's taking images, looking if there's any obstacles, and if there's none, it can go forward. So, automatic driving while thinking. Conclusions. And then we'll have a little video about the future. But after more than two years and months, two years and six months, the mission is performing very well. We've collected the samples. We've already brought a set of samples at three, four locations that is worth returning to Earth. So we've completed you know, most of the goals of the mission, if you want. Now we need to go out of the crater and get more rocks for the next round. But uh, we've already done our contract. SuperCam is working beautifully. We've already done some great science results. I can't show you everything, but we've worked on climate, geology, uh, in-situ resource utilization, some things like that. And we've got already a little history about the rocks. We're still working on that because it takes a lot of time to know, for example, the, the time the water stayed, uh, the, quantity of water for the lake, you know, the different types of work and where they came from. Uh, it's not so easy. And Ingenuity, still flying 52 flights. So what's next? And the next is for the young ones amongst yourselves, because I'm only really getting to for that. But the next part is uh, several missions that will bring back the samples from Mars to Earth. And that is actually the, I mean, the complexity that you see with a single Mars rover. This is going to be multiplied by three, because you need essentially three rover missions to do that. One is going to land safely on the surface of Mars, a lander, and a rocket to bring the samples in orbit around Mars. Then you need uh, a mission that will go to Mars, collect the samples in orbit around Mars. And then you need the, that same mission to bring them to Earth and land safely on Earth. So thank you very much for your attention, thank you bad, and I'm uh, looking forward to interacting with you now. So we'll be taking a few questions now. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I have two questions. Uh -huh. One is, Whenever there is presence of presence of water on Mars is detected, mm -hmm. uh, are uh, sure that whether it was episodic or periodic, that is, once there was a great flood, something like biblical proportions kind of thing, and it stopped. Is it like that, or water was there for quite a long time, and this kind of flood was there again and again and again? I think it is very useful in. Uh, 
detecting these signs of extinct life probably that is the first question second question is now the philosophy of uh, detecting extinct life is whether there was an environment which was conducive for that that is indirect way of uh, this one but uh, viking spacecraft in 1976 they had three experiments which which were directly related to biology mm -hmm. as a uh, person who is well versed in this uh, domain what would you feel uh, was uh, uh, i mean was the kind of experiments done by a viking spacecraft were they sufficient uh -huh. that's it thank you well that's already a lot of questions thank you uh, i'm going to go back if i can very quickly because i think the illustration in one of my slides was good for your first question so i'm sorry because that was in the, during the introduction let's go back so you're right uh, when you talk about uh, floods of biblical proportions that's what we said actually happened in some parts of the planet at a later time so when i show you so it's difficult to right so we've got different proofs of the presence of liquid water on the surface of mars but the best ones for a long period of time where water was flooding would be the ancient terrains where you can see all these drainage areas you don't build these kind of rivers in a short period of time you need a lot and actually we expect water to have flown from some of those uh, affluents more than others and then it would have changed over time same thing will happen for the deposits of sediments you don't deposit a delta like that which is very flat in a standing bottle of water uh, without having water and being there and being present for a long time and those actually proofs of the presence of liquid water will be on the oldest part of uh, the surface of mars uh, when i show those actually those are more like the uh, biblical floods uh, that you're talking about because uh, one way to create those would be for water to be released in a big amount in a short time uh, it could have been done actually several times but some people argue that it could be done only once and from a glacier that would you know melt and then at one point there is a dam that was blocking the water and the dam got released and that could actually create those big big uh, structures that we can see which will uh, are called outflow channels so i agree with you I mean, we can see the two types and why we went to the delta is because we think that the delta is older as typically uh, to 3.7 billion years ago and uh, because that needs a lake in order for it to be formed so the lake needs water that is present for a long period of time not just flood and then at the end of the flood the water gets back into the subsurface and gets recycled some way so there are people working on these models but we are convinced from here and here that there would be uh, water for a significant amount of time what significant means i can't tell you because you know depending on who you ask you'll get different answers and we all bounce on that it's very difficult it's also difficult to to simulate that on earth so we're still working on that question but uh, yes I, we think that what we have is always a significant amount of water staying there um you were talking about viking but maybe there was a question before that one or it's just the viking missions yeah, yeah, 1976, but uh, should I answer that? Yes, this is, uh, this was your second question. Question was, at that time, the kind of experiments which were done by Viking, uh -huh. they were direct. Yes, yes, they were direct. Uh, so there's a number of publications for that, and I'm not really a specialist of it, but I've read a few things. But the first thing that uh, Viking lacked, really, was the diversity of geology that we can do with a rover. So at the time when uh, Viking landed, I can go back here, but they, they landed, I, I don't have the position, but it's one of those uh, flat areas, you know, and uh, it, it's, the, the, if you look at the images from Viking, it's uh, like a desert, it's very flat almost everywhere, and they didn't have the capability to move around and look at different things, so they had to collect the soil and do the experiments on the soil. And that's very restrictive, you know, it's like um, you want to find those flattest, so suppose you have a spacecraft like that, you want to send on Earth and land in a very flat, safe place near the equator, where would you land? The Sahara. And it's not very consistent to finding traces of life there. Uh, you would prefer to land in India, but then you don't have the capability to land in such a I mean, difficult part to land. So, so that's the thing. I think Viking actually missed some of the geology that we can see in different places that we could reach by using a smaller ellipse of landing and uh, a vehicle that can move. 
But then for the experiments, also at the time, they didn't really know what they were looking for. Now we know that on Earth there are some extremophiles that can survive in many harsh environments at a very low level of activity of uh, producing organic materials. Um, out of the three experiments on Viking, I think only one actually discovered something of some kind of activity by uh, the, CO, um, the oxygen release and stuff. It combined it, but then it could not reproduce it. And now we think that this could be explained by using uh, abiological processes using perchlorate. And so that's another explanation. We know that there's perchlorate and that it would react uh, with organic matter and stuff and oxygen. So, so that could be an explanation for what they've seen at the time. But the question still remains, you know, maybe there is, well, there was life on Mars and we're still looking for it and Viking opened the way. Oh, no, man, thank you for the question. Okay, I'll take an online question. So this is from Manish. He says, thank you for the informative talk. And his question is, how does the constitution of ALH 84001 compare to the ones that you investigated in the program? Uh, Ah, that's a good question. And again, I'm not a strong specialist of the meteorite ALH 84001. Well, that's the, uh, for everybody here, this is the meteorite that was uh, in the 90s. Uh, they did some uh, study um, with um, microscopes on the Earth, and they found some potential traces of life on it, and that was published in, uh, in science. So, there were, so the composition of that meteorite is actually a bit peculiar. It's very enriched in carbonates, if I remember well. And uh, the rocks that we have have carbonates, but they don't present carbonate in such amount uh, as what was there. Um, and like I was mentioning earlier, the meteorites that we receive from Mars could come from anywhere on the planet. We don't really know their age, but we know this one is ancient. Obviously, it was coming from uh, it's probably uh, four billion years ago, something like that, from the oldest terrains on Mars. But uh, here we've got to select samples with the context in uh, geochemistry that surrounds them around the geothermal equator. And if we find traces of life on those, we'll be better to argue how it could have emerged. Uh, the thing about the um, potential traces of life that were found on uh, ALH 84001, now we know that there are three indications of potential traces, just like I think I was showing just here, combining these kind of informations. Um, so there was hematite grains that were there and uh, the, the shape also of the potential microbes, but they were much, much smaller than the microbes we know on Earth. So if you're looking for something that's a bit similar to Earth, it would be um, difficult to explain those, and they, they, they are much smaller. And then we found ways to make those hematite grains uh, in those shapes without uh, actually biological intervention. So that's why we don't think there's, these are traces of life in that meteorite. So I hope that answers partially your question. Any more questions here? Okay, we have another online question. Uh, could all the water or fluid have disappeared into some underground uh, aquifers? Yes, this is a very good question and uh, um, Actually, this is still debated among the community, the people who are working on Mars. I've been working a bit on that question myself. So, yes, it's a strong possibility. As I was telling you earlier, uh, so I need to go back, uh, I think, here. So, Mars today is not, uh, does not have the right properties for liquid water to stay on the surface. So, it would either remain uh, solid or sublimate into vapor and go to, mm, possibly to the poles, for example. But underground, uh, you could have enough pressure and enough temperature because as you go deeper into the planet, the temperature rises just like it happens when you dig uh, on Earth. Temperature rises with depth. Uh, you could get potential aquifers uh, deep within the planet. So the calculations that we have for the amount of water. What? Maybe not. Ah, it's coming back. So, yeah, so if you do the calculations, you've got enough pores inside the crust of the planet for aquifers to be there. Uh, but we actually send them uh, around Mars two radars in order to try and detect those potential aquifers. And the good thing about aquifers or liquid water in the rocks is that it can be a very strong reflector for radar signals. And so Marsis, a radar that was on board Mars Express, the mission that went around Mars in 2004, uh, was dedicated to trying to find those potential aquifers. And mostly over the planet, they did not really detect any such uh, 
big uh, places where you've got liquid water at depth. And uh, there was a, a place uh, that they found near the South Pole where they found uh, a lake on the subsurface under the, under the polar cap. But that's the only place. So we don't think that we've got extensive aquifers um, or they are below like uh, 10 kilometers where they are out of reach from the radar uh, probing. Uh, so it's still up in the air, but um, the, the current thinking about the water on Mars is that it's mostly located around the poles and we probably lost most of it with the atmosphere and that would actually, uh, that could be explained, you know, you, you've lost most of the atmosphere of Mars. If at one point it was one bar pressure, it was like the atmosphere of Earth. And you need to go down to 0 0.006, so you need to divide it by uh, like a bit more than 100, right? And in other, if you had water vapor in the atmosphere, it would be lost also the same thing that you would do in order to remove the atmosphere. And that's what Maven, the spacecraft that's looking at the erosion of the atmosphere of Mars is, is doing. And so there, there are ways to actually lose the water, and we think that we've lost most of the water of Mars, so it's not sufficient to create aquifers nowadays. But excellent, excellent question. Okay, thank you. I hope that uh, answers the question. Yeah, Any more questions here? Yeah. Question, okay, so there's a famous saying, women are from Venus, men are from Mars. Any, any questions from the male folks out here? Any question? Okay, if not, I have a question. I have a question. For sure. So, how high is the crater wall that was shown uh, to scale, just uh, to imagine? Well, that's a good question, and I don't really know the answer from the top of my head. It's a few kilometers, but uh, so I think I need to go back to another slide. So let me go forward a bit quickly. No, oh, it's a bit bad because there's no scale on that image. Maybe just after. Yes. So you see uh, the um, delta remnant here is uh, several tens of meters in uh, height, and uh, that gives us uh, an idea of the extent of the lake. The height of the end of the crater, you can see here, the, the difference is going to be a, um, a few hundred meters. And uh, the size of the crater here, uh, you've got the scale here, again, it's uh, like 45 kilometers. But it's not that high that we cannot cross it. Obviously, this is going to be difficult on both sides. So there is a specific point here that you can see the inlet of that river here, that from the delta, where it's going to be easy for the river to cross that, uh, you know, those cliffs and go to the other side. Uh, so Jeremy, uh, you had shown that um, chemical abundances um, spectrum. So is it similar to what we find on Earth, or uh, are there any interesting discrepancies? That, uh so most of the elements that you'll find on Mars and most of the mineralogy that we've seen on Mars are very similar to processes that you can find on Earth. We've not seen, I mean, we've not seen rocks on Mars, even with um, Curiosity, the previous rover, we've not seen rocks on Mars for which the mineralogy is difficult to explain outside of all the processes we see on Earth. Some of them are very peculiar. Like uh, there's some weird uh, 3D night mineralogy that was found uh, with um, ChemCam uh, and um, APXS on Curiosity. And those require some specific conditions from a volcano and stuff like that and acidity. But um, otherwise, we've got places on Earth that can form all the different minerals that we see. It's just that some of them can be pretty rare. And so that's why uh, when we are on Earth, uh, we are looking for analogs to Mars. We go to specific places. So the best places would be there's Antarctica, the dry valley is there. Um, there's the Atacama Desert in Chile, and Ladakh is also a very good place for Mars analogs uh, in India. If we can ever go there uh, to do uh, Mars, you know, simulations. So you need places that are like desertic at a high altitude with low, uh, you know, low pressure. Think like that. I'm very dry. Yeah, uh, this is away from Mars, but there's this whole uh, thing of uh, mining asteroids. Ah. Uh, where does that stem from? Is their mineralogy very different? Are there rare earth materials in asteroids in more amount, or is it just that there's a lot of rock and you can get? Uh, whatever you can. I mean, what's the attitude? Or do we know really which asteroids to target for? Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, 
The, the asteroids, uh, we have studied them from the Earth, and we also sent spacecraft to study them uh, in situ, and they can be classified in different uh, classes. Okay, if you look at the main belt of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, uh, the closest to Earth and Mars would be enriched in silicates. So mostly the rocks, the chondrites that you could detect in the meteorites that fall on Earth. Um, and then you have in the outer parts of the main belt, um, the carbon-rich asteroids. And those we think are actually brought the water and the carbon asteroids compounds in early Earth and early Mars. Um, and uh, so roughly 30% uh, of asteroids are silicate types and you've got like 50%, uh, maybe more, that are in uh, carbon nitrous types. And then 10% of the asteroids have very specific spectral signatures, and we know that those are metal rich. Okay? And those are formed because some of the asteroids that were big enough to differentiate, uh, so differentiation of, of, of those planets actually means that in the core you will collect the metals, the iron, the nickel, and all the different metals, and then you would have a stratification of the body, just like you've got on the Earth, you know, the crust. It does not have so, many, so much metal, but inside the, the Earth you've got plenty of iron and nickel. Okay. And those asteroids so, have uh, differentiated, and then they broke into pieces, and some asteroids actually are pieces of the core of those asteroids. Those are enriched in nickel, they are enriched in iron, they are enriched in titanium, which is quite, quite inter interesting, and gold and other things. And if you do the calculations that potentially you know, only 10% of the asteroid contains all those metals, it could be worth bringing back, them back to Earth. So I made a calculation with you know, one of those biggest asteroids, but uh, at the current rate exchange of metals, if you bring it to the Earth, you could have the whole budget of NASA for 40 years or something. So, but then again, if you bring it and you are able to you know, use this metal, uh, it would crash the, you know, the relay change for those metals, so that would be compensate. But yes. And so people are thinking about uh, mining asteroids uh, for, for that reason. And some of them would be interesting. Yeah. Thank you for a nice talk. And I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, the, you have uh, uh, shown this sound of uh, laser printing on the... So is there any study done on the sound propagation uh, in the mass surface? And that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Other one is about how, what is the lifespan of this rover and uh, how often you are able to communicate and keep it busy all the time? <laughs> Very good questions. Um, so, yes, we, we use this sound uh, in order to study the sound environment of the rover. And we've got a couple of papers that are showing these uh, results. So, for example, typically, um, we know that the sound speed on Earth is uh, 340 meters per second. And uh, on Mars, it's 240 meters per second, so it's lower because the atmosphere uh, is different. On Earth, it's mostly uh, nitrogen and oxygen. On Mars, it's CO2. So you, you, you hear um, the, the sound will uh, propagate at a different speed. And then there is a different effect because that speed also changes with the frequency that you're uh, looking at. And so you've got a slightly different speed between the high frequency and the low frequency, which are faster. And so if you were listening to music on Mars, it would be very weird because you would have the different parts, the, dif the different instruments of the orchestra, which have different frequencies that would reach your ear at different times. So there are those effects that we can study with the microphone. Also, we study the wind properties. We can listen to the wind, and we know that there is less wind during the nighttime and uh, more wind because of turbulence during the daytime, and we can study the turbulence and the scales, and we call them growth and other things. Just, yeah, we're working on all those things, and this is uh, very interesting. So I hope that answers your first question. And the second question was, how do we communicate? Yeah, so what we want to do, because this is a rover that costed uh, like uh, two billion dollars, okay? So we want to get um, our money's worth. So the rover does not get any, day, any day's rest. Um, so on the other hand, we don't want to break the rover. So typically because the conditions on Mars are harsh at night, and because the temperature goes down to minus 100 degrees, the rover will sleep at night. We don't make it do except exceptional circumstances, like for example, we are looking for frost deposits sometimes. So then, at that case, we are going to operate the rover at night. But usually, we don't make it work at night. It works only during the day, from like six in the morning to uh, six seven at night. Uh, but every day, uh, the rover communicates with the Earth. And actually, it communicates with the Earth via so the antennas on the rover are not big enough to com communicate directly to the Earth. So what we do is we use, and this is why it's also important to have orbiters around Mars, 
So we use the orbitals on Mars as uh, relay antennas. Those have big, like two meter uh, large antennas that can communicate with Earth. And the rover uses those satellites. It sends the data from the day to the satellites and then the satellites send them to Earth. So I need to go to the second slide of my talk. That's this one. But yes, so we use typically um, MRO, uh, MAVEN, uh, we use ExoMars and also Mars Express to transmit the data between, yeah, and Odyssey. It's a pretty old Odyssey. Already the, the data bond pass is very low. But we, yeah, we use all the assets around Mars in order to send the data from the surface to Earth. And Earth, what we do is, so we don't work on the weekends, but every day we receive the data from Mars and we plan uh, the next activities from the rover. So if we find a rock that's interesting, we'll tell the rover, well, we need in the coming days for you to go to the rock and to set up the arm and then get some analysis. It takes us about one week in order to do a sample of a rock by uh, taking up the arm and doing the core drain and all these things safely. So every time there's something a bit complicated to be done, we prefer the rover to give us uh, what is done and we give the rover what are the next activities. If for some reason, so for example, there is a time when we cannot communicate with the rover. It's when Mars is on the other side of the sun because the radio signals will not cross the sun. Okay, so when Mars is on the opposite side of the sun, what we do then, we plan one month in advance all the things that the rover can do. And there's a lot of things that the rover can do apart from taking the rocks. For example, uh, it can listen to the winds. We've got also calibration in order to see if our instruments are aging with time. So we can take uh, calibration measurements. So, yeah, um, with the instruments automatically uh, and do a number of samplings like that. So the rover is, is always busy and we are keeping it this way as long as it stays alive. Hi, so um, you talked about some uh, the future prospect of getting the uh, samples back to Earth. Is there any other direction on other planets or other moons to explore? I'm sorry, maybe I didn't get the, the end. Uh, I'm asking if there are other plans or ideas of exploring other planets. Yes, yes. Hmm. Uh, so what I'd like to say to my students is that right now, for people who work on planet planetology, the science of planets, this is the golden time for sample return analysis. And this year we are going to receive another sample from asteroids. So asteroids, because they don't have gravity, are easier to sample and to bring back to Earth. Okay, uh, we've got already plenty of samples from the moon. Uh, more than 380 kgs came from the, uh, kilograms came from the moon, essentially with the Apollo missions, and we've got some Russia uh, samples now, and we've got the Chinese samples now. So samples from the moon are kind of uh, there, but uh, samples from asteroids, we've got them, with Hayabusa 1, Hayabusa 2, now Osiris Rex. But uh, there's a lot more planets that we can sample and bring the samples back, and we start to have a lot of um, experience with looking at these samples with the right way in the laboratory with these huge uh, microscopes that we can look at the isotopic compositions at nanometer scales and stuff like that. Another very important sample that's going to come back in the coming years will be the JAXA mission. Uh, it's supposed to be launched next year. It's called Mars Moon Explorer, and the goal is to bring back samples from the moon Phobos, which Actually, we don't know if it's an asteroid captured by Mars or if it's a piece of Mars that accreted on Mars. And actually, since there is a change of material between Mars and the moons of Mars, uh, this could be the first Martian sample returned to Earth before the. Uh, so the Japanese are very, uh, very uh, happy to, to do this mission and how it's going to work, also because I'm involved with it. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, we bring back samples from many different uh, planets. We need to work out on the other possible planets. And the big samples that we would like to collect would be samples from the icy moons around Jupiter because we think Europa is an habitable place. Uh, there's people talking about samples coming from Venus. That would be mostly an, asteroid, um, an atmospheric sample. You know, you don't really, it's difficult to go to the surface and collect things and bring back. Uh, Mercury could be also. Uh, a thing because we don't have met any meteorites coming from Mercury that we know of, or from Venus for that matter. And Enceladus is another target for possible sample uh, return. So over in the next decades, so I'm not talking about, this decade is going to be dedicated to Mars and probably more asteroids comets. 
But the decades after that, we are probably going to look at uh, sample returns from further down the solar system and uh, the icy moons for Jupiter and Saturn, these are the goals that are clearly indicated into the decadal surveys. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a great time to actually look at, at the samples coming back and try to study them for, for those very reasons. All right, so if there are no more questions, um, let's thank Jeremy for taking us on a tour to Mars, uh, sitting here with the planetary. And uh, for any more questions or discussions, uh, he's around. Uh, now may I welcome uh, Professor Tarun Swarupeep to uh, felicitate Jeremy and also give the closing remarks. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, many of you would be as excited as I was to hear about this uh, story of, you know, how this exploration is going on, uh, going to go on with the coming decades and how science and technology will keep playing a role as we explore the cosmos, uh, but our solar system first. And uh, so thanks a lot uh, to uh, Jeremy to make time to come to Bangalore. I, he has the rest of the week here and he is going to visit his show. And so I'm sure you'll have fruitful uh, discussions, but it's very important to reach out to the public and I'm sure many of the people following this on the YouTube channel or later who would see this would really find it very informative and exciting also because Indian space is also kind of gearing up for a lot of ambitious plans and you know, it's lovely to hear such uh, exploration, uh, scientific exploration of the planets. Um, it's my pleasure to hand over a little memento for you to you know, remember this inaugural lecture here. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you much.